So it's a very strange story. In a way, I'm sort of paying back a debt, and in a way, I'm uh, confessing to um, an untruth. So I thought I should come and give this talk at this place. Because when I made my proposal for a grant at FQXI, which they eventually um, granted, um, I actually had two parts in it. One was research in quantum gravity, and the other was um, to work out something called, that I called the Medusoanthropic Principle. So cramming that into the middle of an eight-minute talk. The idea is that um, it's a transformation of Lee Smolin's suggestion that we have this universe is very unusual because there's an evolution because some universes make more black holes and therefore have more babies than others. And my suggestion was, no, this universe looks like it's much more fine-tuned for intelligent life than it is for stars. The astronomers immediately jumped on him and said, no, 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 it's not really the maximum for stars or black holes. So I said, ah, but life is so incredibly improbable, maybe the fine-tuning is for life. If you just ping the constants of nature a little bit, we probably disappear. I'm willing to believe that. So, um, in order to close this loop and have an evolutionary process, a successful industrial civilizations have to make black holes. Okay? Because then a, a universe with intelligent life in it would have more babies than others, and so almost every universe would be fine-tuned to produce life, just like fish eggs are fine-tuned to produce fish. The name Medusoanthropic Principle had to do with the jellyfish, which has two different life stages, which seem to be completely unrelated, the polyp and the medusa. And at first, people thought they were different species, so that was the metaphor. Okay, so um, the reason, and now when, when I offered to put that in as part of my research, the physicists who reviewed it said not to do it, because that was too weird, and I should just do my research in quantum gravity, that was nice enough. And the lie was that I said, okay, I'm accepting that as a directive. The truth is, I thought it got me off the hook. Because I've been wanting for years, actually ever since I gave a talk about this in the philosophy department, some philosopher was absolutely horrid to me and said, well, I would be impressed if you could find some way to prove it. Well, all right, yeah, I mean, I'm just a mathematician. What do I know about proof? Um, but um, but I, it, it really bothered me, and it's incredibly hard to find any way to test this. It is, just sounds like just clever words. But about a year ago, it suddenly hit me, this has a testable consequence. If it is true, that the universe is the way it is because of an evolutionary process where intelligent civilizations produce black holes, then A, it must be possible to produce artificial black holes, and B, it must be useful. So we can test that. And after I started looking at this a while, I decided I didn't care about the Medusa-Anthropic Principle anymore. I cared about whether we really will eventually want to do these things and whether they're useful. Because I started doing some back-of-the-envelope calculations. And no equations, eight minute talk. Um, but there's a semi-classical formula for how fast a black hole of a given radius radiates and what its lifespan is. And there's a relationship between its size and its mass and so on. And nobody had ever looked at those from the point of view of saying, well, could we actually make one of these? So I started doing some back-of-the-envelope calculations, and I found that the smallest size black hole I could imagine making, which would be of uh, nuclear dimensions, um, would weigh on the order of what you would want for a starship. It's in the right order of magnitude of mass for a starship. It would be emitting energy fast enough to get a reasonable drive out of it. And it would have a lifespan on the order of a century, which is about right. So it, that's about the right length you'd want it to be for a trip. So I mean, just took these standard formulas that come from Hawking semi-classical approximation, plugged some numbers in, and I found out that the really rough back of the envelope calculation says we could just barely make these. Now I had already, in my first paper about this 15 years ago, proposed a technique for making them. The way you make them is you make a huge concentric laser and you fire it off very, very precisely so you get uh, an inward 
directed um, uh, electromagnetic pulse. And if it's big enough and powerful enough, it eventually gets inside a Schwarzschild radius and it makes a black hole. So you'd make one that would be much smaller than any natural process would make. Uh, anything that came from a natural process would be completely useless to us industrially because the Hawking radiation is trivial. And there's a, a limit on, called the Eddington limit on the um, radiation from, from infalling matter. So it, it, it wouldn't be any good for anything. But these things are very, very hot. Energy just pours out of them. So how would you build them? Uh, two minutes? Madre de Deus. OK. <laughs> OK, so, so we need three machines. We need a concentric uh, uh, laser. And this would have to weigh about 10 to the 9 tons. And it would have to be a nuclear laser. Machine one. Machine two, we need some way to move these things around. Well, the way you move it around is you put it in the center of a parabolic mirror. You, you, you line this with a gamma wave reflector, which you can make with an electron gas. Um, there's other possibilities. And then you have beams that throw, energy, that throw matter back into it, which have the twin effect of pushing it so it goes, it, you don't lose it. It goes along with your starship. Um, and it, uh, um, so it keeps going. And also, they feed it, so it's stayed at a constant uh, temperature. So um, then, eventually, we'd like a third machine where you just bring one into near-Earth orbit, and you surround it with heat engines, and it solves our energy crisis. Now, this would be a huge investment of energy to make in the first place, and it would be a huge investment of energy um, to charge the laser. But once you've done it, you, once you have one of these, it just keeps making more energy out of water. So in the long run, it's a big multiplier. Once you've gotten over the heat, you have all the energy you want. And if you make enough of them that you can dot them around the laser and use them to drive the laser, then your third generation technology is that you have a machine that makes black holes out of water. So once you're to that point, um, uh, you know, you're home free. And you never run out of energy. You bring one into near Earth orbit and beam the power down. And you can use it as a star drive. We've done some back of the envelope calculations. And if you're willing to believe that 90% of the mass of the, of, the, of the starship can be reactant that eventually goes in here, then you can, in a human lifespan, it's actually possible to get all the way to Andromeda. So that's the suggestion. The engineering is really, really hard. But just let me make, I mean, really, really hard. I'm not an engineer. But I don't see it. But it's all with physics that we really believe. Now, I should say, this is using the semi-classical approximation. It will be a challenge to quantum gravity to figure out what corrections it makes. So uh, my conclusion is either quantum gravity will get us to the stars, or we'll never get there at all. Because the, the other way I can imagine of driving something big and heavy uh, all the way to the stars would be antimatter. And I want to claim, first place, actually having a safe way to confine the antimatter is really, there's just nothing that's going to hold the antimatter in that isn't going to shove ordinary matter in too and cause an explosion. And the efficiency of producing antimatter, this is in the literature, there's a literature on antimatter rockets, it's 10 to the minus 7. So whatever you have to do here, if you're going to do that, you need 10 million times as much. So this is the, the, the easiest way to get to this. It's very hard to get to the stars. It's even hard for us to get to Mars. But, but to get to the human beings in this form, or even robots, to the stars, this is the only way we're going to go. So, um, and if we do it or if we don't do it, the destiny of the human race is completely different. Either we stay here on this one planet forever, or we go explore the universe. And I'm really convinced that it's the only possibility, and it's just barely possible. And quantum gravity will tell us, yes it is, or no it's not, when we understand it well enough to get the corrections to the semi-classical picture. Okay, that's my... Great. Okay, that's my... Thank you very much.